Well, this is going to be another episode of the Argo Adventures, I guess, or I can't remember what I named this series because I got myself a YouTube manager, even though I don't make any money, but he's been uh, helping name things and do playlists and stuff. So what are we doing today with the Argo? Well, I had something specially manufactured for it, and it's this thing that you can't see fully on my desk, but it folds down this way. Now, before I get too much further in this, if you guys spot this weld here with a join, uh, that's my fault. Um, I didn't make this, but I did mess up my measurements and have to change my mind halfway through its manufacture. So, yeah, it ended up with some joins. Before that happened, this looked positively beautiful. I mean, it still does now, but it looked really nice. He did a beautiful job of it, and that's why I get this bloke to do it. Now, um... Another symptom of my measurements, I measured very accurately and didn't allow a tolerance for the end cap on this tube. So it's now about half a millimeter off actually fitting uh, the pin properly into the uh, receiver hitch. Now, this is the actual receiver hitch off the Argo. It's here. This is designed to take a tow ball and it fits into a Heyman Reese style box tube with a pin. So the idea here is that this will fit in there as well. Now, why would I want such a crazy thing hanging off the back of the Argo? Well, I'll explain that in a minute. What I do need to do first is I need to take this step drill, um, also colloquially referred to by some as a Christmas tree, and uh, just enlarge that hole to the next step. Uh, and that should allow me to get that pin through. Um, otherwise, it would be a beautiful, perfect fit. And this guy has produced everything perfectly to my measurements, um, including all my mistakes. So yeah, I wasn't quite on the ball uh, when I drew this. I've been going through a bit of stressful stuff. But if you have a look here, the top end of this has box tube welded onto the side. This should form a fake transom for my little electric outboard to fit onto, or a petrol one if I ever find one. And because it runs down like this, I can fit a little pad here for the main tube to rest against as well, reducing some of the stress on the tube of the uh, outboard. So this should all work very nicely. And uh, original design had a single gusset. We've now switched to a double gusset as well. Uh, now, this is all capped, but in case you're going to go, well, what happens if it gets full of water? Well, we have a drain hole here as well. So, uh, because conceivably, if this goes under, um, even though it's all sealed at the top, the water level could conceivably push up into here a considerable way. It will remain to see, uh, remain to be seen how airtight the top is. But if I know this guy, it's going to be positively, perfectly airtight because he's top notch at his work. So, um, yeah. So basically, we've got to uh, make way for this pin. And it's in the middle of the night at the moment when I've started this video. So, uh, yeah, you'll probably see. If I turn off my desk lights, you'll probably find it actually is pretty bright here. So, or pretty dark. Um, so, we'll wait till the morning. And uh, we'll go out and check if we can get this pin in. We'll put our drill through. And we might mount our transom mount. We also have to change the gearbox oil because I'm up past my first ever 20 hours in the thing. So we'll uh, need to do our first gearbox oil change. So that'll involve suctioning some oil out, taking the drain plug out and scraping off all the uh, all the shavings off the new gearbox and then refilling some new gear oil in there. So we might do all of this in the one video um, because I think it's probably a bit short to be just doing the transom mount. Uh, we also have the uh, outboard motor and the battery to install. And if I poke around off camera here, we have a couple of Anderson plugs to fit as well. And off the side of the camera here, I'll have a quick look and be back in a moment. And that moment happened right now, thanks to pausing. We'll also be fitting this cable to the battery, which uh, connects to my good Victron charger, my multi-mode charger. So that will allow us to disconnect the battery, lift out of the Argo and recharge quite easily. Um, and then we also have to come up with some sort of method to stop that battery sliding around in the back. We don't want our balance point shifting while we're on the water. So, um, we should be looking pretty good. So we've got a few things to do. 
So um, I'm going to grab some sleep and through the magic of video editing, it will now be the morning and we'll be out to do some more work. So see you in a moment. All right, so it's the next morning and it's a bit of a wet and miserable day. So oil change might not happen today, but we should be able to put this guy in here and have a look. Hopefully my camera angle's right. I can't see the viewfinder. We'll grab our pin here. And we'll try and wedge that in there just a tiny bit out. So I think it's going to be Christmas tree time. And uh, we'll work that out. Put our pin back in here so we don't lose it. Let's go get our cordless drill. Alright, I've got a feeling I'm going to get wet in a bit. Let's adjust our camera angle down and do our best with the weather conditions we've got. So let's um, go forwards. We'll just go slow with this. And I'll probably need to probably do... What have we got? This one. Put it up nice and tight. in this way as well. Just trying to get a nice burr free job in there. Let's put this back in here and see if we can get our pin in now. Oh, close but no cigar yet. Just about to come out the other side. So I think this side needs a little bit more. Let's have another crack at this. Try it out now. Aluminium at least is very easy to work with. Although I'm gonna guess there's a few Americans here and you're gonna call it aluminum. very tight probably won't get that out now yep I'll give the other side another crack we'll be back in a minute all right so a bit more of an adjustment we're in nice and firmly and we're in good and strong so let's get her outboard and just see how she mounts and we'll take a couple of photos before I get wet because you can probably see there's raindrops starting to fall here Alright, so we've got our outboard test fitted. I've left the prop off for now. Um, nothing's connected per se at the moment. Um, but uh, we've got it right. I'll have to probably hook these guys up to an Anderson plug in a bit. Um, but so far everything looks to be working pretty well. Um, I'm hoping there's enough radius at ground level that I can um, pull this latch up and fold it up. I'll try that in a minute. I need two hands to do that. Um, but our little shaft will fit just nicely inside the back. I know I've got the Argo tarped up at the moment. Um, that's because of the imminent rain. Uh, but this is fairly easy to remove as is, even keeping it attached to that bracket. So that's good. I can transform fairly quickly and easily. So this should make for some nice silent running. And this little water snake guy is a 54 pounder. So roughly two horsepower. Um, and uh, we've got our voltmeter on the back and everything as well. So um, it should be relatively good. Um, I want to see if I can fold it up or fold it out of the water. Uh, and uh, after that, we'll see how we go. Just give me a moment. I've got the camera balanced very precariously. And I'm going to try and see if I can pull this up and out of position. Cool. We should be able to mount that out of the water and drive around without too much trouble, but that shaft is bouncing quite a bit, so I probably would hesitate to do that um, for long travels on land, but I guess with this, I can pull it up like this as well, and then lock it up like that if I need to as well. Actually, that might work well. That should probably stow all right for traveling over land for a distance. I get the balance just right. Cool, that's not bad. I think that's going to work rather nicely. If I can slide you down, 
going to be a bit of a technique to it, I think. Do that. And then drop you in. All right. I should be able to get used to that. That won't be too difficult. All right. Um, I think I might go do some mucking around with the battery because it's undercover. We'll unmount this and bring it inside. All right. Cool. No worries. All right. So we're around at the battery and I'm down on my knees. Contrary to what appearances, uh, or contrary to what you might believe, this is a brand new battery. Um, fully charged, it's just the weather's been shocking lately. So, we've got terminals here. I want to see if these terminals, the smallest ones, will fit through this bolt. They will just nicely. Okay. So here's a washer. Okay, now, before I do anything else, I've got these two Anderson plugs here. I'm going to unplug them so they don't end up with a short. So let's put our two red terminals on one side of this battery. All right. So the two things I'm putting on here, as I mentioned earlier in the video, there is an Anderson plug and then there's my Victron charger plug. That means I can just lean over and plug into it. Yeah, where are we? There's our other two terminals. We'll chuck our washer and our spring washer on. Do through both of those. Put these on. And I'll position them such that the terminals can sit nice and flat. And then I'll get my ratchet spanner on here. Now I think off memory, these are 13 mil. So the middle one with a 13 there, and that is doing up. Oh, these might be slightly bigger, these might be 14s, which will be other end of the spanner. That way. I don't want to do that so tight as to bust the terminal out of the battery, but I want them on firm so that there's no real issue here. Now, at some point, I'm gonna find some way of insulating these terminals so that there isn't an accidental short circuit in the back of the Argo. Now this battery, I think, I'll put some zip ties on these too. Um, where was I heading with this? I've lost my train of thought. Um, at some point, uh, I'll have to find some way to strap this into the tray in the back of the Argo too, so we'll work on that. Now the reason I unplugged these two is if I was to plug them together, I have two exposed terminals floating around that can easily touch. So we don't want a short circuit. But anyway, that's our battery prepped. Now I have to work out how to get this onto the outboard motor. Um, whether I just attach the existing terminals or whether I splice and solder them, which is probably the way I'm going to go. Um, we'll come up with some sort of way. Uh, anyway, it does mean that I can't accidentally wire the thing backwards as well. Anyway, it's starting to rain now, so I'm going to retreat inside. Okay, so some time has passed and we're back inside. So the time to connect these wires together has come. Yep. My apprentice is in the background uh, giving some commentary as well. Yep. And I'm so we need to work out here um, which is positive and negative. I'm going to go with the red stripe being positive. Uh, and because I've misplaced a manual, I can't confirm that for sure. So I'm going to put a um, very low or a low rating fuse in my uh, switch panel up in the background here. I'm going to put a couple of clip leads on this and see if the voltmeter lights up or whether it lets its magic smoke out or whether it blows the fuse. We'll find out. So let's see here. That's our red stripe. That's our black stripe. That's our negative. Let's just confirm. That negative is actually in the correct position. That one's our positive. Let's flick our switch. So we'll go up here, we'll flick our switch. Okay, and we'll come over to the unit. Go past all the junk here. And we have volts. Okay, that's good. Okay, so now we've established that the polarity is correct. We need to decide how we're going to join these terminals. Now, I could adjust bolt them together 
um, and that would be good, but it would create a big lump and I'd have a bolt and that would increase the probability of a short circuit. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of chopping these terminals and joining these wires, uh, largely because I don't like the idea of disconnecting the wires from these terminals, which are crimp on. And this is some very hefty, very strong cable um, with very low volt drop. I'm more inclined, I think, to splice these properly and put a bit of heat shrink over them and do the job properly that way. And this is nicely stranded um, tinned copper wire on both counts. So I think I'll be able to get a very strong splice from that. So uh, let's fire up the soldering iron and get some ends chopped off. Alright, so let's um, trim these connections off. They come off with a fl flush cutter. These ones are going to take some force and probably a couple of nibbles with these little cutters. Um, because I don't want to find my big ones, or at least I don't know where I put them. I've got a tool drawer right at my right hand side here and um, I don't put all my big stuff in there. I put my small stuff which I most commonly need on the desk. Sometimes it's not real suitable to the big things. Right, now I need to find my strippers and get these stripped um, off to the right here. Is these things, um, and I should be able to strip. Well, these are a bit stretchy. So this stuff, these don't always work quite that well. So sometimes I've got to give them a gentle squeeze with the flush cutters, flip them around backwards, and slide the insulation off. Now I don't want to twist these this time. Instinct for me is to twist the conductors when I pull them off but this time we don't want to do that. Alright, just get them nice and parallel. Now we've got to do that for these ones. That's going to take some tools and three hands so I'm going to pause the camera while I do that. Alright, so now that I'm finished having fun with a pair of strippers um, we're going to join this together. Now this is where we do not want to get this backwards. So that is clearly our red wire. We're going to deal with this first. So I think I'm going to decide on a size of heat shrink before I do anything else. We're going to start with our short wire here and thread on. Now ideally I should have done this before I stripped the wires. Um, just for various reasons this is a whole lot easier to do um, when the wire is still in the insulation. Alright, and we need a much bigger piece. Um, let's go with black again. It can potentially go over the whole join. I'm going to pick a big long piece because this is going to be a hefty join and uh, for the sake of simplicity that's going to go on the other side. And I'm trying to squeeze this in a way that holds it open. Both of you guys can go through the big one. Sure, there's lots of puns I could be making right now, but it's getting on in the night and I'm tired. Right, let's just double check here. That's our red wire. That's our black wire. Now, I'm going to straighten all these up. I'm going to try and get as close to the camera as I can here to show you what I'm doing. Now, I'm going to gently wriggle these together and try and get them to intertwine as best I can. Um, in fact, we might even split that up a little bit. I'll try a slightly different method here. It's sort of a form of braiding what we're doing here. Some of these where the conductors will slot together very nicely, sometimes they won't. So we're going to get these in like so, and I'm going to go past the um, insulation a tiny bit here. Now this is, I should have blue tacked everything down because things are trying to move around and it's making coordination difficult on top of what is already challenging. Alright, that should give us a good splice. I'm going to stick things down off camera and then we'll get the iron nice and hot. Alright, we've got everything mostly prepared. We're about ready to solder. Now, my little baby Weller iron here, which is of about a medium size, has nowhere near enough heat to even think about doing this. So we're going to use uh, Mr. Stoner Torch here and a uh, big blob of solder. Um, now I'm going to turn on some extraction fan here which will create a bit of background noise. And we're just going to heat these wires and we're going to try and use the uh, solder here to melt or use the wire to melt the solder not the flame. Otherwise you end up with 
hot solder on cold wire and that doesn't work real well. So we want to try and get this soaking into that. Every time, and I swear this is a Google thing, every time I unlock my phone it sends me notifications. It's a sort of a Google nag thing. He's active. Let's send him notifications about crap he doesn't care about. We might be able to sell him a product and make some more advertising revenue. Now I'm just going to keep feeding this in here while I've got heat on. And it should nicely wick through the whole lot. Now, some of you guys that are experienced in doing this stuff are probably going to have much neater ways of doing this. And you would be correct. And my gas torch has just died. Um, luckily, I have a backup one for exactly these moments. And my solder got a little bit cold there. As I was saying, there are many neater ways of doing this. Um, I'm going for strength over um, appearances. But we really want to get this hot through to the core and really get a good strong join in there. All right, that's starting to really wick in there, and it's also starting to separate. So, get a bit more solar in here, and then I'm going to give it a pair of a squeeze with a pair of pliers while it cools off. All right, we'll be back. All right, so we're up to number two here. Now, the reason I'm filming this one, and because you've already seen it done before, um. There are, one of the ways you can keep this neat and way that I would probably do if I had the material available is if you get a bit of solid core Cat5 and you strip out a single strand of that, um, you can wrap that around this join uh, and that will hold the join together much more strongly whilst you solder it. And that is a way of creating a much more structurally sound join as well, but of course I'm kind of dealing with what I have, um, as is usually the case. So uh, this is probably going to have to be, I think this will be suitably strong and carry plenty of current because we're pulling something like 50 or 60 amps across this in um, worst case scenario. Um, any more than that and I'm not going to be unhappy if it melts out because it will be overloaded and it will probably be blowing a fuse somewhere. Oh wow, I just got my finger. I'm so glad I've got fume extraction going at the moment because this stinks because I've kind of burnt one end of the wire there. All right, we'll finish this one off camera. We'll be back and then we'll do the heat shrink. Okay, so what I did want to avoid is little stragglers like this poking up, but uh, I think we will live. Um, largely because those little stragglers can end up poking through the heat shrink. I'm going to try and fold them around the side here rather than trim them off because I think trimming them off too close could end up actually making that scenario worse. So I'm going to, as I put this on, I'm going to rotate the heat shrink and it is already shrinking because that join is still kind of hot. So as I put this on here, again I'm going to try and go with the grain here and fold everything over. Get them nice and evenly spaced and all. We'll give a bit of heat to shrink the heat shrink tubing. A lot of people use heat guns for this and they work like magic and I have one right next to me but this thing is a whole lot more convenient and has much more potential to make a mistake and I think that one's getting low on gas. We'll try this one. I did bring a tin of gas in the other day. I should probably refill it. Did a whole bunch of rope ends with it the other day. Alright, now let's just pull that nice and straight so the tubing sets straight. And we'll do our big one, and then we're through the really tedious bit of hooking up our Anderson plug. We might actually get round to putting the propeller on this thing tonight. I picked this thing up a couple of months ago, and I've never actually bothered to put the prop on it. Big stuff can be a bit of a trick to getting this on. You can get glue filled heat shrink too for this sort of thing which is magic. Probably in a wet environment, probably not a bad idea actually. But I try and start at one end and get the, the shrink going and then chase it along with a flame. 
I keep picking up that green one. Maybe it's just because I like green things. If you couldn't tell from half the stuff on my channel. All right. Isn't this riveting? You're watching somebody shrink, heat shrink a tube. Although, probably not all that crazy because I see a lot of these like ASMR videos and stuff of people doing things that could normally be considered to be kind of boring and everybody loves it. So maybe it could be the heat shrink channel. Anyway, not the prettiest of joins, but also not the worst. And I am going to push this down and with a pair of pliers and try and get that tubing just setting into a nice uniform shape. Okay, so that now means I have a quick connect Anderson plug on my electric outboard. All right, let's let that cool off and then we'll look at this prop. All right, we're up to the propeller. Now, there was a manual that explained how this was done, but I'm pretty sure I can remember that I need this bit. Um, now, my senior technician, okay, my old man, gave me what I presume is some sensible advice. He suggested I make sure I have several more of these little um, gudgeon pins, I think they're called. Um, anyway, uh, because there's a good chance I may lose one. And uh, I presume that's probably quite sensible. He says he's had a bit of experience in his many years over that sort of thing. Now let's see if I can get the motor on the desk. Oh. Yeah, this is an awkward position, but this is actually quite a serious amount of motor weight here. It's actually probably quite a seriously big electric motor. So now, I need to turn this around a little bit for a reason that will become apparent shortly. So I need to fish my players out. Oh, and by the way, we did actually get uh, Mr. Stone and Torch Green refilled. All right, now, I think if we put our pin in here, it's just going to fall straight out. So we do need to rotate this motor shaft around, which I think is going to be aided by the pin that is, in fact, the problem. And you can see here that that would be quite a problem. Only there we go. Quite a bit of torque in the motor, so it's hard to turn. Now, I'm actually inclined to do something a little dodgy here. I'm going to take the tiniest little bit of blue tack here, shove it over that hole, and I'm going to stuff the pin through it. Um, so that the pin is less inclined to fall out. Um, and this stuff doesn't tend to gum up in there too badly. So let's shove that through the hole and see if that will stay in situ with a little bit of resistance. It is probably just enough that it's less likely to fall out. Which I think may save me some heartache further down the track. And I've just lost a piece, but that's why we have under desk lighting. But that is now a black piece on black carpet. One moment, or maybe two. So that piece fell under the least accessible place humanly possible. So let's have a look. So that is our lock nut. That is our tool to do up our lock nut, I believe. And this, I think, is supposed to fit that way along that pin. Now, I'm going to need to quick this up off the desk a bit. Let's use the hitch out of the back of the Argo. Might be just about right. Or I could have been wrong. So now we need to swing this around slightly. Slide you on. And then we need to do this bit up. Like that. This is supposed to be a weedless propeller. I'm not sure what that means. Unless the blades are just sharp and cut the weeds up or something. I don't know. Now this little spanner I believe is designed to help facilitate putting the prop on and that you can tell my desk has a slight downhill run here that is quite firm all right now all right i would desk test this but um trying to pull 50 amps through this distribution box is probably ill-advised it is possible the wiring's heavy enough but the fuses are not and that is by design uh, because sometimes I might overload things on my desk. I'd much rather things blow a fuse than blow up the equipment. 
So, let's find a safe place to park this. I'm probably going to have to wait till morning before we can test it. Um, and we will have to uh, find a way to strap that battery down. And I've also got to do a transmission oil change. But I have secured Tinkerman Mick. He's uh, an associate on my channel. Um, you'll probably find uh, he'll be uh, my rear admiral, I guess. Or I'll find the correct Navy terminology that sounds hilarious, like able seaman. Uh, he's going to come and run rear in the uh, Argo for a water test because he's got experience with these things. And uh, I'll probably need the extra person rather than climbing over the seats myself and falling in. So, let's find a safe place for this and we'll be back in the morning. Alright, so the time has finally come to do gearbox oil. And uh, I've stopped around to get Tinkerman Mick to give me a bit of a help with this one. So, this could get to be a little fragmented. I've got a tray full of bits and pieces and tools and oil and stuff in there that we need. So, uh, yeah, we're going to get started. The first thing we've got to do is get down to that little yellow plug right there, pull that out. And shove a vacuum pump in there and suck all the oil out. So uh, after that we're going to go around this side with the firewall off. And we're going to find the drain plug that is down there in front of my finger. Um, we're going to scrape all the shavings off that magnetic plug, put it back in and then we're going to top it up with oil. Around about a litre I believe. So let's uh, get cracking. Alright so we've got the vacuum pump out. I'm going to pull the dipstick out and we're going to suck everything out through the dipstick hole. If this suction pipe will fit all the way down there. Oh, turn the bilge pump on, that's not good. Let's turn the isolator off. Alright, now I think I'm probably in oil there. I don't know. I'll go down in a straight line, I guess we'll go till we can get everything out. I'll pump all this out. We'll be back in a moment. Now this is uh, the bit where we've got to be patient. The oil is very viscous and it's just taking time to come through the vacuum pump here which the pipe wasn't long enough so uh, we're just going to tape it down to the top of the Argo here. And yes, uh, we're all masked up at the moment too and I've got sanitizer sitting over there. We're doing everything right. So uh, yeah, anyway, we'll keep at this until the oil's out. All right, so I think I've got most of the oil out of it. It's a bit tricky trying to maneuver this tube right to the bottom of the gearbox, obviously because there's gears in the way. Um, but I've tried very much to follow the path of the dipstick. All right, so now we're gonna get the rattle gun there and we're gonna take the drain plug out. I'm gonna find uh, the right adapter to do that. All right, so time to remove the plug. Now I've gone from a three quarter inch to a half inch here to try and get this on here and it doesn't fit what is it with well, these screwed up halfway in between sizes all right so I gave up looking through my socket collection I found my flexible head spanner or ratchet spanner we're gonna use this guy and hopefully not lose my fingers in the process and we'll see how much oil spews out into the floor pan find out how much I've got. There's a bit of thread tape on that. This by the way is a half inch 12 point ratchet spanner. But I'll buy the correct socket for this at some point. Well there's still oil coming out of that. I think I'm going to suck a bit more out. All right. Now most of the oil I came out was a different color so it makes me wonder what's going on. So give me a minute. All right we dragged a bit more oil out. Let's see if we're below the drain line yet. Oh no, still not maybe. Um, I do some thinking. I might get the suction hose down here and try and suck it out as it comes out. This could be a three-handed job. We've taken the floor pan out and we'll put an ice cream container under here and we're going to just drain the rest of this out and we're going to have to hold this in place get oil all over ourselves and the camera but uh, I don't know if you can see from here what's going on I'm trying to juggle everything here hopefully you can see it's not much coming out just a little bit but I'll shove the um, suction tube in here thank you mr. third hand um, and I'll chuck the suction tube in and try and get the rest all right let's 
vacuum up some of this oil. And we'll get it in. Try and get as much of this out as we can. Which is not going to be much by the feel of it. We'll at least suck the stuff up out of the drain can. It's like a big long straw. Alright, we might try the little one in there again, but uh, get around to wiping that plug off and we'll be back. Alright, so we've got the drain plug out, and there's definitely, it's a magnetic plug, there's definitely some little bits of gear shavings on here which was indicated in the manual, so we're going to wipe all that stuff off. I'm going to put this guy back in. Um, before we do, I'm going to shove the, uh, the small tube in there and just try and get the last of what I can out of that gearbox. And uh, I'll put this down here so I can't fall any further. So we hope we'll get that small tube in the drain plug and just try and extract the last of the oil out of there. Alright. Alright, so I've got most of it out. I did a bit off camera. Um, frustrating as it was. Now I'm losing a bit of dexterity because MS and all. That's why I don't do this for a job. Now we'll get our ratchet spanner and make sure we've got it the right way around this time. Alright. We'll do this up suitably firmly. This is a magnetic drain plug. And then we'll get our Tom thumb pump and we'll put some oil back in the thing. Hopefully we don't overfill it. Alright, so we're up to filling it up. And I bought some new ADW90 oil. Uh, this is gear oil, same stuff that was in there, and it stinks. Um, I bought fresh stuff instead of using my own stuff. I also got myself a Tom Thumb pump, which has got a little hand pump on it, and I removed a little aluminium hook on the end because we don't need it. What attracted me to this brand was not its statements about being natural mineral oil or anything, but it was this nice little lifty pouring spout. Now, the advantage of doing things this way so I can keep a good idea on exactly how much oil is in there when there's measuring marks. So I think they said it uses one quart, which I think is a little over a hundred, uh, a little over a litre, or a bit under, one of the two, whatever a quarter of a gallon is. So yeah, we're going to be here for a while because this is thick stuff, so we'll jump to uh, the point that this is full. Now that we're getting there, um, I'm going to fill it right up to the 900 mil mark. Nice and easy, and I don't have to fill the bottle very much. Um, in fact, we might stop a little bit short because I think that the displacement... Actually, you know, I'll fill it up to 900 mil, and then I'll look at the displacement after that. All right. And I've got oil everywhere, but that's normal. All right. Let's put everything back together. So we're at 900 mil. What's our displacement for our pump? It's about 50 mil. Radio, so we can get an idea of where we're at. And I need my oil rag again. Where I'll put that. Alright, we'll be back in a sec. Alright, so we're in here and we're going to pump some oil in and we'll see how we go. And this makes it so much easier. I'm going to put about half of this in and then see where our dipstick's at. Just, we'll be here for a little while. What are we at? Still got a bit to go yet. Not a lot of oil in this thing, but let's see. All right, let's let it settle for a minute, settle for a moment, and then we'll put our dipstick in and check the depth. All right, so I got the dipstick in here. I'm just going to check our level and see where we're at. Um, we haven't touched the bottom of the dipstick yet, and we are down approximately 300 mil. Um, well we're down from 900 to 600, so still got a bit to go yet. I'll keep pumping. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, so we're down a bit more. Check how much is in there. Have a oil rag. Um, so what are we down to? We're down to 300 mil, so that is 600 in there. And 
we'll see where we're at. Drop our dipstick in and see if we've hit the bottom yet. Give it a moment. Pull her out. So we are, it's hard to tell where we are here. I still don't think we've hit the bottom of that, off, that dipstick yet. We'll dry it right off and shove it in there again. Give it a moment. And yeah, I think we're right on the very bottom of it. Got a little bit more to go yet. So, all right, keep pumping. Yep, we're down about 800 mil. So I've just checked the dipstick in, we come in the bottom. And Tinker Man Mick here happily informs me that one quart is about 950 mil. So one, about one liter in here is about right. So we need to top up our Tom Thumb pump a little bit and then pump a bit more in. So uh, shouldn't be too far off. All the way past the rubber seal. And we're on the very low mark, which is about where we want to be. We'll put about two or three more pumps in and we should be about spot on. Hopefully. Okay, one more, for good measure. All right, we'll let it level out the gearbox and we'll be back with a wet dipstick. All right, well we're nearly ready and the rain's coming in. Where are we at the moment? We are right on the low mark. I think a few more pumps and we should be right. I like to be just a little bit above the low mark, um, but of course the high mark is for when it's hot. So we'll wipe that clean, we'll whack a little bit more in, and we'll see what we get. It'll probably come down a bit once we uh, run the gearbox a bit too, because it'll dis disperse it around the gearbox. Right, and I'm nearly about out of oil anyway, which would have been about one quart. Even though these are made in Canada, and Canada quite intelligently uses the metric system, but they didn't use metric nuts and bolts, they used UNF. But anyway, just because things are weird. Alright, let's have a look now. We appear to be about two thirds of the way between the two marks, which is about where we want to be. I reckon I'm going to shove this dipstick back in. We're going to give it a quick little uh, test run up and down the driveway and then we'll double check the oil level. Yeah. More cool toys. One more, one more, one more, okay. Right, we've given it a couple of laps up the driveway, as you saw. We'll check the gearbox. Well, we'll just clear the dipstick off and check our oil level and make sure nothing crazy's happened. All right, so we appear to be pretty well in the same spot. All right, we're doing good. So I think that bit's done. Now I'll have a look at how the outboard fits on the transom mount, just as a bit of eye candy. I can't remember if I've done that or not. And then some point later on when we get home, I'll mount the battery into the floor pan. So. Alright, well we've jumped forward uh, probably three or four days in this little jump cut. Um, and a lot has happened. Uh, but we're up to the final bit here of working out how to strap this battery down. Presently it's in the back. Um, now there is a hole under here, this is a heavy battery, but you can see there's a piece of 4x2 under there just to keep it roughly level. Now I'm going to put a strap over the top here, um, and I've got a cam lock strap and a few other bits and pieces here, which have cost me about 900 bucks, or they probably will. Now I know they only look like 20 bucks worth of parts, 
but on the way I went to uh, pull up at the lights and the vehicle didn't quite stop the way it should have and so of course I think I've done that on the one set of lights in town that has a red light camera and it went flash so I think I'm probably gonna see a fine but if I'm lucky I can talk to the magistrate and tell him what happened I think it's probably up to a bit of residual oil that's left over on my brake discs uh, from the brake flange changeover and of course we've all been in lockdown here in Victoria so none of us have really been out and about all that much including the vehicles so maybe I can plead my case maybe I'll get out of it otherwise I'll just have to pay it and you know shit happens anyway these very expensive little handles I couldn't find the proper latches that I wanted so um, I wanted some nice little square rings to strap on down here um, to hold the strap on I couldn't find any that weren't round or that were really obtrusive so um, I really only need to hold this from bouncing around and this is a plastic liner um, so I'm not too worried about drilling holes in it so I'm thinking from here I'm basically going to uh, just put some self tappers in and I finally found some self tappers with square drive heads not the good maxim ones that I like these are painted but hopefully um, they might do the job anyway let's get cracking I'm doing this under artificial light and, and I've got to get around the other side and I had to dodge around the outboard motor which I've got on the transom mount now because precision here is not exactly that important I'm not even going to bother measuring where I put these I think there's a reason that bumps there. I think there's a steel beam in the way. So, erring on the side of caution, we're going to go through the floor, which just lifted up slightly, and I think that's because it's resting on the floor as well. So, what we'll do. Once we've got this battery positioned, we'll lift this bar out and we'll shave those bottom bits off. Uh, or lift the whole tub out. Yep. Could be easier said than done, but anyway. Not all bad. As, with, as usual with these jobs that I do in the middle of the night, I'm making a hash of it. Where's my lighting? Let's move our camera. Alright, so. We've got our two... Um, handles, if you will, uh, tied down, and I've got a couple of these cam lock connectors, or cam lock straps, we're only really going to need one of them, um, unless they're too short, we'll find out in a minute, Come around over the top, get their grunt brand, Let's see if that sort of helps. I don't think it really does for this task. This is just to stop it bouncing around. And yes, I'm going to need both of them. I didn't think they'd be long enough. So let's go through here. Now, one of the problems I've got is it's actually kind of cold out here. Pretty sure it's snowing in the nearby mountains. And I've been using hand sanitizer relentlessly anytime that uh, I have to go anywhere public numerous times a day and I have no natural oils left on my hands which means I have very poor grip all right so that one can hide down there you can come up here okay so that strap is doing something funky down there shorten you up a bit and then that should in theory go there and you can go down there. Is our battery strapped in nice and firm? Okay. And I think we're done. And I think we're done with this whole video. This whole uh, bloody red light fine thing has kind of got me bothered. I haven't had a fine in like six, seven, shit, close to ten years. So, uh, 
and we do have the ability in Australia to apply for an official warning for some things, but that's not in, that doesn't extend to red light fines. So I am probably going to have to take it to court and plead my case and see if they let me off. They may not. We'll find out, I guess. We can only try. And I'm dropping screws down the wrong side of things because this packet fell to pieces because it's crap plastic. Alright, I think by now guys it's pretty clear I'm not having a good evening. So uh, I think we're going to call it quits in this video and hopefully you'll see a better video in the future. I have got some bits and pieces filmed in out of sequence stuff. I might put some of the previously unaired stuff together for a, uh, a lockdown video, just stuff to keep you busy while you're in lockdown, stuff that was filmed in between some of the restrictions that happened. But it'll come out of sequence and there'll be a disclaimer on the screen. So anyway, I hope this has been an interesting video. There's been lots of bits and pieces. This has all been filmed out of sequence as well. So see you in the next one.